so this presentation is going to cover uh, the basics of how training works in the United States. I'll talk about our different training pathways um, and then a basic overview of how our curriculum is structured, although um, notably there is no standardized curriculum currently in the US either. So starting with pathways. Um, so at the beginning of cardiothoracic surgery in the United States, initially it was created around the 19, late 1920s when the field consisted of mostly treating empyemas and tuberculosis. And there's been significant adaptations and evolution over the last century, as I'm sure it has been in Brazil and uh, as well. And training programs have needed to continually to evolve to change in practice. Um, so in the US, uh, there are two governing, major governing societies of training programs. It's the American Board of Thoracic Surgery, the ABTS, and the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, or the ACGME. And they're primarily the ones responsible for regulating the number of programs and the training positions in the US. Board certification uh, for cardiothoracic surgery requires passing a computer-based multiple choice exam and an oral examination at the completion of training. And board certified cardiothoracic surgeons are eligible to practice in both cardiac and general thoracic surgery in the US. So the evolution of cardiothoracic surgery has undergone quite a significant change and particularly in the last two decades as well. In the mid late 20, 2000s or so, um, cardiothoracic surgery training in the US actually reached a low point where there were more unmatched positions than matched positions. Um, there was declining surgical volume. There was a lot of uncertainty about where the future was headed, particularly in light of new advances in interventional cardiology as well. So there needed to be significant reform at this time if the specialty was to remain relevant and successful. And you can see here, this is the matched program data um, from the 1990s over all the way to about 2008 is what we have data for right now. So a changing paradigm was needed. In, in 2003, the American Association for Thoracic Surgery or the AATS uh, president at the time, Dr. Crawford, called for a change in the training pro, uh, paradigm to rejuvenate the specialty. And he specifically said that there must be efforts to engage medical students and residents, change training programs, and adapt to changing perceptions. And this would require innovation in simulation-based training, new models of resident training, and a more streamlined educational curriculum. Um, and this was, at the time, the current medical training in the United States. I want to go over this before talking about the different training pathways for cardiothoracic surgery. So, so we do four years of college here, then four years of medical school, and then we match into a residency program. And there are a few different residency pathways to get into cardiothoracic surgery. The ABTS currently recognizes three particular pathways that lead to board certification cardiothoracic surgery. There's a traditional pathway, which involves five years of general surgery, and then a two to three year fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery training. In addition, there's a fast track four plus three program that's four years of general surgery, three years of fellowship. And then the pathway that actually Claude and Alex and I, all three of us are in, is this integrated six year combined program. And this is a relatively new development. And it really emerged in the 2000s and afterwards when you saw previously on that chart where the low point in cardiothoracic trainees and interest in cardiothoracic train. Uh, training was at a decline at that point. So the application process, the curriculum, um, and of all these pathways vary quite differently and even vary between institutions that offer these tracks as well. So in this traditional track pathway, medical students apply to complete general surgery residency, which is five years, with the option to conduct two additional years of research. During their fourth year of general surgery, residents apply to and then try to match into a cardiothoracic fellowship program. And there are both two and three year track fellowship programs, depending on the particular program or institution in the US. And then ultimately they get board certified by both the ABTS um, and the American Board of Thoracic Surgery um, to, or, or they're eligible for the American Board of Surgery and the American Board of Thoracic Surgery so they can practice uh, general surgery technically as well as cardiothoracic surgery. And then in addition, they have super fellowship training is an option if um, additional training in heart failure, transplant, aortic surgery, congenital is, is warranted. In this other uh, pathway called the Fast Track 4 plus 3 program, medical students also apply directly into a general surgery program. And then in their second year of general surgery, they apply for a cardiothoracic track within the same institution. 
Some of them will also do some years of research in between this. And then ultimately they go on to complete cardiothoracic surgery training, a three-year uh, process at their own institutions, and then ultimately get board certified by both the American Board of Surgery and the American Board of Thoracic Surgery. So these residents also, when they graduate, can practice both general surgery and cardiothoracic surgery, and then can also get a, additional super fellowship training um, in respective subspecialties. And then finally, this integrated program um, is a track where medical students apply directly um, out of medical school to this integrated track. Um, we do also complete some general surgery rotations in the first two to three years of training. The last three years mirror the same traditional track. Um, we have some programs allow for additional years of research. For instance, Alex and I have both taken some time to do some research at our institutions. And then at the end of training, we are board eligible for um, the American Board of Thoracic Surgery, but we will not be able to practice general surgery because of the integrated pathway. And then in addition, we can also do super fellowship training as well. So this is just, there's a lot of information that I just covered as I know, but there's, this is a little overview on each of the three pathways. The traditional track is considered the gold standard in some ways. It's the way that cardiothoracic surgeons have been trained for decades, but it is, it is considered the longest pathway. In this fast track four plus three program, um, resident performance can be assessed in general surgery training before they progress to a fellowship. And it does maintain the opportunity to have a chief residency year in general surgery. Um, the integrated I-6 pathway is considered an accelerated pathway. Um, and in some ways, you know, over the last few years, at this point, we've had many residents who have graduated from this program and are now practicing surgeons all over the country. But in in some regard, it is still new and considered experimental. Um, and it leads to board certification only in cardiothoracic surgery and not in general surgery. Um, so again, this is another summary slide of all of these. And um, Rodolfo, I can send you a copy of these slides if you're interested to, um, for anyone who would like a copy to see it in more detail. Um, so that's a basic overview of the pathway to becoming a board certified cardiothoracic surgeon in the United States. Um, and I'm going to briefly touch on the different curriculum um, of training currently. So first of all, I want to make clear that a standardized curriculum in training does not exist. Um, there's just too much variability. There, in, some institutions have some strengths in certain subspecialties and not in others. Um, different rotations are going to be different for each of those institutions. But the goal of each uh, training curriculum and each training pathway is to prepare a resident to be able to operate independently and safely in cardiothoracic surgery. So many different components must be considered, including how a resident acquires technical skills, decision-making, judgment, clinical knowledge, research, leadership, team-based training. Um, different institutions, as I've said, have different strengths. And there's also increasing financial and regulatory board pressure for the best possible outcomes. And so that does make it difficult to prioritize training residents. And I think that is not um, a factor that's unique to the US, it's probably um, all over the world that that's a, um, unfortunately a factor that needs to be considered. So curriculum here by the numbers. So currently eligibility for American Board of Thoracic Surgery certification is dependent on the completion of a certain amount of time um, spent in training and a performance of a minimum number of index cases as the primary operating surgeon. So generally accredited programs in the US are restricted to an 80 hour work week, which is averaged over two to three weeks. We generally take call every few days or so, approximately two weekends or so a month. Um, the American Board of Thoracic Surgery requires an average of 125 major operations each year as the primary operating surgeon with a minimum of 100 in any one given year. Um, residents who trained or started training after 2007 must actually meet specific operating requirements for one of two pathways, either cardiac or general thoracic. So here is a uh, maybe a little bit small for people to see, but this is a general list of case requirements to be board eligible uh, for cardiothoracic training in the US. And you can see that the requirements in each of these categories, whether it's congenital, adult cardiac, lung, esophagus, VATS training are gonna be different, whether you're on a cardiothoracic pathway, a general thoracic pathway, which means you're gonna primarily practice thoracic surgery versus cardiac surgery. Um, and you have different uh, variability in the caseload requirements. 
And there's a lot of variability um, in graduating residents um, based on whether they're cardiac track or thoracic track, um, as you can see in the number of cases that they perform in terms of cabbages or AVRs or other, um, other operations that are listed here. So in, in this paper that was written um, in 2013 that looked at different curriculum across different pathways of training. Um, there's a lot of acronyms here, but there's um, you know, in comparing integrated programs versus two to three year traditional track programs versus four plus three programs, all the pathways that I had uh, mentioned earlier. There's a lot of variability in how much time the resident spends on a cardiac rotation, on a thoracic rotation, or a congenital rotation. I think just driving home the point that um, you know, there is no standardized curriculum. We try to just ensure that the resident gets the number of cases um, that they need in order to meet board certification. So in this integrated um, six-year program that, you know, the three of us are in uh, briefly, this is how it's broken down. The first three years are predominantly general surgery and you get some early exposure to cardiothoracic surgery and some adjuncts to cardiothoracic surgery training, including um, experiences with imaging, perfusion, some, uh, some additional exposure to time in the ICU as well. And then the last three years for us are generally similar to a traditional track program where we have rotations in cardiac surgery, thoracic surgery, and congenital surgery. And then we also have some time that's devoted to other emerging areas of training, which includes structural heart, TAVR, TVAR, minimally invasive training, aortic transplant robotics as well. So um, I'm going to specifically speak to I6 residents because that is, um, you know, the pathway that um, that we are most familiar with here. Um, and there's a lot more data published right now on the I6 pathway. This is um, kind of a general pathway of operative experience for I6 residents based on their their year. So if um, in general, if they are thoracic. Um, time spent in a thoracic OR for thoracic track residents are gonna gradually increase here and the time spent in general surgery will gradually decrease um, across training over the six years of training. And then this is a general breakdown. You know, we, we training for, when we train in, um, in cabbage or AVR, the general process involves training based on components for technical skills acquisition. So this is um, a, a guideline of when this paper was published a few years ago, a PGY-1, most of the PGY-1s were doing sternotomy. Um, and by PGY three or four year, they were doing some IMA harvest, um, some were doing some valve sutures and potentially starting to do some coronary work and then moving on to later years, a redo sternotomy even in later years was still relatively rare to do. So the goal now for training is instead of just a time-based model, training is evolving to a more competency-based and um, based education. So the goal here is to allow each training institution more flexibility to design their program, but also ensure that core competencies are standardized um, and met. And this also gives some flexibility in the recognition that residents acquire different skills at different speeds. So this is um, something I think that we at Emory do, and I'm sure is similar at Michigan and Rochester as well. Um, we have these competency-based um, models that we go through throughout training. And every um, couple months or so, we sit down um, with our mentors and look at where we're at in terms of each of these uh, boxes going from level one all the way to level five. So I just took you know, a sample of what this would look like for medical knowledge for ischemic heart disease. So level one, which me, uh, probably someone who's just starting residency, these are the things that they're expected to know. So some of the basic anatomy, um, some of the presentations of ischemic heart disease, diagnostic tools, all the way over to level five where they're understanding um, more of the outcomes of ischemic heart disease, understanding the syntax score, um, and then going through all of these check boxes as they go through training. Um, and then the same goes for patient care and technical skills for ischemic heart disease. So from level one, um, demonstrating some basic surgical skills all the way to level five, um, performing a reoperative cabbage operation and independently performing some procedures as well. And then you're expected to slowly progress through these boxes um, as you go through training. Um, and to, 
you know, optimize the training that we have in the operating room, um, simulation-based training is emerging as uh, more and more important as well as an adjunct to training and something, you know, actually during this time of coronavirus that um, we have tried to incorporate more in training as well. Um, so these are these little heart uh, vessel anastomosis boxes that um, are sponsored by the Thoracic Surgery Directors Association. Generally, every resident who is in a ACGME program gets one of these box trainers um, and you can practice anastomoses using these plastic tubing models um, on your own time. And I wanted to go through that we, uh, excuse me, we have various, um, for this model in particular, um, we have grading schemes where you can also get better at using this particular simulator. For instance, this is a 13 uh, component based assessment tool. And I just did a snapshot of a few of these items. So you can be graded on graph orientation, on bite, on spacing from um, a grade of one where you're not able to you know, orient the graph to a grade of five where you're able to orient it and um, there's no hesitation. You're able to do it very consistently. Um, and we actually practice are also standardizing the faculty assessment of the trainings as well. And so um, this is a project that I worked on where we looked at all 13 components um, of using that anastomosis model and trying to get the faculty graders to also agree on where the resident was at at each point um, in, in this component-based system. So as the curriculum has continued to evolve, you know, endovascular therapies, robotic therapies are becoming more and more uh, prevalent. Um, we have um, as the TSRA and um, our accreditation councils have also recognized the need to incorporate this into training and currently TAVR and all um, other endovascular techniques are also becoming incorporated into um, the standard for board eligibility and board certification. So in conclusion, there are three major pathways to becoming cardiothoracic surgery in the US. And we anticipate that all of them are still gonna remain available and valid. There's benefits and drawbacks of each and trainees and programs generally make their own decisions about what the best fit is for them. Um, there remains great interest and there's also some uncertainty regarding, regarding the optimal way to train a cardiothoracic surgeon. Um, I don't think we know the best way. I think it's dependent on a lot of other aspects. And so I think these three pathways are still relevant and available because of those reasons. Um, as a specialty, we are moving away from a time-based model, um, time spent on certain rotations to more of a competency-based model. And um, I showed you some of those competency-based guidelines um, in this presentation here. And we're still continuing to adapt to the changing practice and innovation of current training. <laughs>